there was a, a time in my life when I was a, a fifth grade teacher. And it's, I will tell you, it's the only job I ever had where I had to kneel down and pray for the strength to make it through the day. So any time since then, when I, after I came to Washington, that I had uh, uh, the potential for a difficult day, I just remembered that, and it makes it a lot easier. Plus, of course, uh, teaching fifth grade is really very, very good preparation for working in Washington because there is so much fifth grade behavior uh, that goes on here. <laughs> Uh, attention span, uh, uh, you know, focus on, on real outcomes, et cetera. Um, welcome to CSIS and welcome to our, our event on defense logistics modernization and information systems in the 21st century. I have a couple of housekeeping items that I would like to, uh, to lay out for you. Uh, the first is uh, please take your cell phones, your pagers, your other electronic devices that uh, tend to uh, interrupt or make noise at inappropriate times and either turn them really loud so we'll know who to blame or turn them off uh, altogether. Um, I actually should do that to my own as well while I'm saying that to you. Um, secondly, you'll see that we actually have quite a full agenda and I'm really uh, uh, grateful to all of you for coming out here this morning and uh, it's a you know Good Friday is a difficult day uh, it's a it's a, um, a day where a lot of people have other plans and other opportunities and so we want to make sure that we recognize the the value of the sacrifice you make uh, for being here today uh, our agenda has one break in it it's between the two panels um, and I would encourage you to uh, recognize that and to conduct yourself accordingly. If you need to take your own break uh, independent of that, uh, please try to do so in as non-disruptive a manner as possible. I think all of us will appreciate that. The reason we're doing this at CSIS, our charter actually uh, calls for us to foster public discussion and debate on critical national security issues and international issues. And certainly the question of, of logistics and logistics support to operations uh, is in that category. But as many of you know, because most of you are in that business, uh, logistics often gets shorted when it comes to real visibility and public discussion and even a recognition of the importance of the process. You're all familiar with the, the old saw that says uh, amateurs do strategy, professionals do logistics. And, uh, and that, in fact, I think uh, proves itself time and time again when we actually get into real operations. So I think the criticality of the subject matter is, uh, is absolutely essential. I come from South Louisiana. I come from alligator country. That's where I grew up. And, uh, and I think often about that when I hear people criticizing the tail and trying to emphasize the tooth as if somehow they're not connected. Uh, if, you, if you watch an alligator kill, you'll know the tail is as important as the teeth uh, to do in that, uh, that killing and eating. The survival of the alligator critically depends upon a robust, powerful tail. And I think that's the way I like to think about logistics, and I think you'll see as we go through the course of the morning that, uh, that much of that comes into bear. We also, for both our speakers and our panels, we have uh, anticipated uh, leaving time open for questions from the floor. Uh, I would like to ask you to have those questions be guided by the subject matter of the day, and uh, let's focus on logistics. There are plenty of other national security and defense topics that are always prominent uh, and, and easy to get at, um, but this is, this is the day for logistics, and, and I would uh, hope that we'll take advantage of the opportunity with the excellent panelists and speakers we have here today to focus on those questions. So um, with that, I welcome you all. I'm going to turn the microphone over now uh, to my boss, Dr. John Hamry, the president and CEO of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Dr. Hamry. Uh, good morning, everybody. Gosh, it just uh, shows what a free breakfast will do to bring out a crowd. I mean, I can't imagine on Good Friday having an audience like this, but Ash, it's got to be you. It's, got, it's the only reason. We, no, seriously, I'm delighted to have you all here. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an important, such an important topic. I can, you know, I, I used to quite regularly go out to National Training Center out uh, at Fort Irwin, and, uh, you know, I, I'd see the, you know, the brigade commander beginning, you know, and then I'd see the after action. He was really whooped, and almost invariably it was because of material conditions that he hadn't been keeping track of, you know. And it's such an important part of, uh, of the world that we just don't pay the public policy attention that we should. So the, I just had a conversation with Ash uh, about this, and we were, I guess I was probably teasing him about uh, the endless tanker 
you know, acquisition process. And uh, he said, I'll come over, but I don't want to do anything about tankers. Uh, and I said, well, let's do something about logistics. And he said, I actually would like to do that. I think he said that would be important because I spend far more of my productive time on things like that, and I'd like to have a chance to talk about it. So, Ash, thank you for agreeing to do that. Now, Ash and I, we go back a very long ways, and, and I will tell you my first experience with Ash was when he was at what we used to call PA and &E, I don't know what we call it now, CAT or CAPE or something, whatever it is. And uh, Ash was there and he was interviewing me and he decided I was not at all qualified to be working for him, which was, and he was right, because he needed far more technical competence than I had. And uh, he's brought that technical expertise to every one of his positions and I think now is just doing a fabulous job. So Ash, we're delighted you're here. This is a, you know, it is an unusual thing to be having a conference, especially with this sort of a of a turnout, the quality of this audience is remarkable, and I think it's a testament to you and the topic. Thank you. Ash, why don't you come and join us and give us this. Thank you, John, and CSIS for having me. Uh, my, uh, <clears throat> I've learned so much from John Hamry, and every day I look around the Department of Defense and there's one of his managerial accomplishments, one of his managerial creations in front of me, and uh, uh, one of the best, uh, most skilled stewards and COOs the departments ever have. I see Jack Gansler, a predecessor of mine who added L to AT&L, uh, uh, and uh, among many other things Jack did. Uh, Jack, I have to tell you, my children are, are already dismayed at the length of the title. They say it's to, you know, they tell their fathers, Undersecretary of Defense, of course, no one knows what an undersecretary is, and it sounds very beneath. So, underneath, underwear, <laughs> undersecretary, and then it's acquisition technology and logistics, <clears throat> way too long and obscure for an 18 year old and a 21 year old uh, to explain. They, they, they say, Why can't you be CIA director? And Dave. <laughs> It's got some zip to it. And Dave Berteau, also a great leader in the acquisition technology and logistics uh, field. I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to come here. It is a pleasure and a uh, welcome relief to talk about something other than the tanker competition or the joint strike fighter uh, or any of the other uh, acquisition programs. And it's particularly uh, welcome to me because what I want to talk about today is something that's very dear to my heart, which is the role of acquisition technology and logistics in supporting the current wars, the current fights that we're in. So when John gave me the opportunity to speak about that subject, I leapt at the opportunity. Uh, last January 5th, it was, that Secretary Gates offered me this job. And one of the things he said to me at that time, he has said publicly many times, which is, Ash, uh, the troops are at war and the Pentagon is not, and especially at &L. And I took that on board, and I've tried to make it a priority of at &L to support the wars. And I'd like to share with you the ways in which we are trying to do that uh, first with rapid and responsive acquisition support to the warfighter. Secondly, it, with management of contractors on the battlefield, contingency contracting. Third, the special case of countering uh, improvised explosive devices, IEDs. <clears throat> and then fourth, and for most of what I have to say, the topic of this day's conference, which is logistics. But let me say something about rapid acquisition and contingency contracting uh, and counter IED uh, first. I'll start with a question that Secretary Gates uh, posed in his Foreign Affairs article about a year and a half ago that Jack Gansler had posed before that in a, a very important Defense Science Board study on the same subject, and it was, why is it necessary to bypass existing institutions and procedures to get the capabilities needed to protect U.S. troops and fight ongoing wars? Why is it necessary to bypass the existing institutions? I experience this every day, and we are, to get back to Dave and his alligators, uh, busy fighting the alligators, but also trying to drain the swamp. 
uh, at the same time and fix this problem in a more structural way. But let me describe to you the catch-22s that one comes to as a department in trying to respond rapidly to uh, urgent needs from the theater. Uh, the first is uh, uh, catch-22 to get over is how do you know what the requirement is? How many UAV caps do we need? How much persistent surveillance do we need? Uh, how uh, many MRAPs do we need? In many cases for an, an ongoing and evolving conflict and a, a piece of uh, equipment that we're just beginning to learn how to use, that's an unanswerable question when one embarks upon the acquisition. We don't know. We know we need some. We don't know exactly how many. And yet we have a system that won't get started until it knows what the final answer is. And I'll give you an example in a moment of getting over that, but it's, if you, that is if you don't know the requirement, how can you begin to acquire? But in some cases, it's just unreasonable for us to know what the requirement is. We just know we need to get started. And every day you spend trying to decide ultimately how many you need is another day you're waiting to get started, another day that piece of equipment isn't in the warfighter's hands. Second catch-22 is, uh, wouldn't it be worth waiting for something better? And of course, in time, you can have something better. But right now, I'm focused on the next weeks and months in Afghanistan. So something that's better, that delivers next year or the year after, not interested in right now. So the 80% solution, as Secretary Gates says, uh, is... Uh, something one has to learn to manage to in the case of, of support to rapid acquisition. The third is, well, we could get this, but is this something we want in the long run? Is it something that fits into the long-range vision of the Army's table of equipment, the long-range vision of the Marine Corps table of equipment? Maybe not. Maybe it's just for this fight which if we win the fight, it'll be worth having something that doesn't quite fit in to the long range future. And the last, of course, is how do we get money quickly? Congress provides the money. Congress appropriately keeps a close eye, uh, doesn't <clears throat> give us open-ended ability, uh, open funds, and so forth. And so there's a constant interaction with the Congress to explain what we're doing, explain the urgency of what we're doing. Uh, and when we're able to do that, we're, 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 we usually uh, get their support because nobody wants to hold up the delivery of something to the warfighter. The example I'd give you of getting over these four catch-22s, which, again, uh, every day, this is blocking and tackling. I say my job is, 90, is uh, 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 I guess, Thomas Edison said uh, uh, of his job, 90% perspiration, 10% inspiration. That's what working these problems feels like. I'll give you the example of the MRAP ATV, which is the all-terrain vehicle MRAP that we are fielding right now in Afghanistan. Uh, and just to show you how fast the system can go when we really light a fire under it, we uh, uh, completed the source selection for the MRAP ATV in July last summer. Uh, the first ATVs arrived in Afghanistan in September. And we've already accepted more than 5,000 MATVs, and almost 1,000 of them have actually been fielded, that is, in the hands of soldiers by now. now that's very different from your 10- and 15-year program of record. That's less than a 10-month program of record. Vehicles actually fielded and in the hands of the soldiers. Initially, when we set out to say how many are we going to buy and how many are we going to produce per month, the, our logisticians and uh, commanders in the theater were saying, understandably, they could only afford to, they could only field 500 vehicles per month. The reasons for that are, uh, those of you logisticians will understand, it's the for want of a nail phenomenon. You can't bring the vehicles in because you don't have a place to park them. You don't have a place to park them because you don't have the concrete. You don't have the concrete because they don't make concrete in Afghanistan. You've got to go to Pakistan and get your 
concrete and truck it in. So you have to have the truck, so you have to have the parking lot for a truck, and around and around and around you go. Everything is like that in Afghanistan. Uh, and so it wasn't that we couldn't produce more vehicles, it's that at that time we didn't think we could absorb more. Nevertheless, I decided that we're, we were going to produce them at a rate of 1,000 a month anyway. If we had extra vehicles in Charleston or at Oshkosh or in Kandahar or at Bagram, okay. <clears throat> Better an MRAP without a soldier than a soldier without an MRAP, first of all. Second, we could use the excess vehicles for training so that every soldier, and this is now the case in Afghanistan, the troops that are arriving have their driver's license on the MRAP. They don't have to be brought out from the field, taught to drive the vehicle, and then sent back out in the field with the vehicle. They arrive ready to go. They fall in on the vehicle. It's a familiar piece of equipment to them. So I thought we ought to buy them for the training ranges. So out at NTC at Fort Irwin, where I just was a couple of weeks ago, there are, or John mentioned earlier, there are MRAP ATVs. Down at JRTC, there are MRAP ATVs. Out in uh, 29 Palms for the Marines, there are MRAP ATVs. They're there so the, the, the soldiers can learn how to, to use them. So I, bought, I wanted to buy more than we thought we could field, and we did. And I also had in the back of my mind, you know, I'll bet you we'll figure out a way to increase that number from 500 per month to a larger number. Because I think when the troops get them, they'll like them. When the commanders see them, they'll like them, and they'll figure out a way to get more. And sure enough, we have. We, we've looked at the whole logistics pipe, I'll say more about this later, that begins in Oshkosh and ends up on a FOB in Afghanistan, every piece of that, and tried to see if we could widen that artery. And we have now. So we're now up to being able to absorb 1,000 a month. So it's a good thing I'm making 1,000 a month. But there's an example of not waiting for the final answer, but beginning to acquire and ramp up to the 1,000 a month level figuring we'll, we'll figure it out later. We'll figure it out in a few months. We don't have to figure out everything in order to get started with anything. Uh, so the, the MATV is an example of something that we have, and we, I could give you many, many more examples, where we have succeeded in supporting the warfighter, but it's always been by hot wiring the system rather than by driving down an, an open. Lane, and it's really true that we have an acquisition system which is still has the Cold War vestige of it, namely designed to prepare for a future war rather than or to conduct a current war. And we're only still eight years into this learning how to have a system which can conduct current wars, learn from experience, respond to stimuli from the battlefield, adapt, and deliver what the current warfighter uh, needs. Uh, <clears throat> we're taking some steps to put that on a more enduring uh, foundation. Maybe at another time I'll come back, John, and share our thoughts. Some of Jack Gansler has had some of those thoughts already. Uh, but I have told the entire acquisition community that Responding to operational needs, I've said, is their highest priority. Uh, if you're a service acquisition executive, if you're a PEO, your highest priority is responding to those ONS and JUONS. And also giving them a menu of ways that they can work within the system but work quickly. So I think we're getting the MRAP lesson into the acquisition system writ large. Say something about contingency contractors. I don't need to tell this audience that, the, that our way of waging war uh, brings with every soldier to the battlefield approximately one contractor. Uh, it's interesting to look back on the numbers. In World War II, there was one contractor for every service member. In Vietnam, one for every five. In Iraq, one for every 1.2 service members. In Afghanistan, one for every 
In other words, more contractors than soldiers. Uh, because of the heavy reliance we have now on building new FOBs and uh, construction required to do that, most of the transportation is done by contractors. So there are 107,000 contractors now in Afghanistan, uh, of whom about three quarters are local nationals, which is not a matter insignificant for the economy of uh, Afghanistan. And I think it's fair to say that first in Iraq and now in Afghanistan with these ratios, uh, we have been on a learning curve about how to manage a contractor workforce that large. And for sure, everything has not been done perfectly uh, over these years. Um, and uh, part of that is because it was such a new thing to have so many. Part of it is because in the exigency of war, you just have to act. And part of it is that I suppose we've all kept telling ourselves it's not going to go on much longer. We don't have to get good at this. We don't have to get used to it. We do have to get good at it. We do have to get used to it. And we do have to learn how to do this better. And we are getting better. I won't say perfect yet. Uh, we have a number of very constructive uh, oversight bodies, the Commission on Wartime Contracting uh, and others has a distinguished membership. We're working down the same list they are to improve the quality of the, um, uh, the controls and so forth that we apply to contingency contracting without sacrificing effectiveness. I'll give you an example in Afghanistan today, which is the use of cash. Cash we used a lot of in, in Iraq and initially in Afghanistan. Uh, obviously, that increases the vulnerability to fraud in the last year, we've reduced our cash payments in Afghanistan from 39% to 9%. Very dramatic. How are we doing that? We're doing that by banking by phone. Believe it or not, in Afghanistan, many people bank by phone and are, and are willing to bank by phone. Now, we're paying them on their cell phone rather, with ca rather than with cash, greatly reduces possibility of fraud uh, and made very dramatic progress in that regard in just in the last year. I'll give you another example. Many of you probably know what a contracting officer representative or core is. The core isn't the person who writes the contract. The core is the person who makes sure that the contract is being carried out in the uh, required way. Any of us could be trained as a core within a short time. It would take us longer to be trained as a contracting officer, that is, to be able to contract on behalf of the United States government uh, and spend money. Core is sometimes is easier and can, can be, in theater, a part-time job. Uh, we've been doing a great deal to improve contracting officer representative presence in Afghanistan. This is not a mundane thing at all. Uh, I'll give you some examples. Uh, in uh, the last year, since I've been watching these figures, uh, in Afghanistan, our contracting officer repre representative force, which at the beginning was only 38% of the requirement, is now 84%. So we've got 84%, still not 100%, but 84% of the contracting officer representative posts filled that we should have filled. Um, we are now, on all the Army and Marine Corps units, before they deploy to Afghanistan, are training within the units, contractor uh, uh, corps. So they deploy with that skill because now it's recognized that that is part of the skill set required for a modern expeditionary force. So they deploy with people who know how to carry out the contractor part of their mission. We're giving them automated tools, little things you put on your laptop, which, automat which pull up the forms that they ha that tell them what they should do for a certain contract, what the requirements are within that contract for CORE to help them ease their way. Uh, the department has added 10 general officer positions to contingency contracting in the last year. 
very important move so that senior two and three star positions that deal with contracting uh, uh, that senior positions are filled with two and three star uh, officers so this is an exam this cash and the contracting officer representatives are just two examples of the kinds of thing we're trying to do to get good at something we recognize as an enduring part of the American way of waging war uh, and I'm trying to maintain a balance here in the department, and I hope a balance here in Washington and a balance here in theater between uh, 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 being able to uh, be excellent stewards of the taxpayers' money on the one hand and be agile and do what is required in Afghanistan now uh, on the other hand. We need to maintain that balance so if contracting officers and contracting officer representatives have the feeling that it's an environment which is not conducive to them taking any risk at all on behalf of efficiency and responsiveness to the warfighter, they'll seize up. We owe them an environment in which they can make that, yeah, they can strike that balance uh, appropriately. And I'm trying to do that. Uh, counter IED. I want to say something about that. Uh, the Secretary uh, Gates asked me and the Director of Operations on the Joint Staff uh, several months ago to would we focus for these months intensively on making sure that the art we are doing everything we possibly can as a department in the coming months for this fighting season in Afghanistan uh, to combat IEDs I don't need to tell you in this audience that IEDs are a triple problem uh, they are obviously a threat to life and limb uh, but also to mission success. If people can get outside the wire, military and non-military, then they can do the mission assigned, which is the COIN mission. If they can't get out the wire, outside the wire, then they can't. So it's essential to mission success to defeat the IED. And finally, it's essential to the morale of people in Afghanistan, our coalition partners, and the American people themselves. So in all three of those ways, the counter IED fight is essential. And the Secretary said, would you just, I know no other way of doing this than to do it myself, would you just every day make sure that we're doing everything we possibly can? And that's what I do, every day. And I'll give you some examples. And this is just a matter of getting everybody here in Washington, in the Defense Department, in the intelligence community, in the services, in the various task forces, MRAP task force, ISR task force, biometrics task force, JIADO, and so forth, and in theater, the various commands and echelons in Afghanistan, CENTCOM, all focused on these next few weeks and doing everything we possibly can for this fighting season. My discount rate is huge for this particular part of what I uh, do. And we've had, and just by focusing in that way, we've been able to do some things that I think are going to be very important as the summer goes on. Let me first, to accelerate the delivery of critical counter IED enablers to the troops for this season. Give you an example, and this is to the total of several billion dollars over the next uh, weeks and months. Uh, these are robots. They are handheld uh, metal detectors and ground penetrating radars. They are vehicles. And there's something you'll begin to see if, over Afghanistan, uh, which are elevated line of sight, in particular airship borne sensors. We are pushing all the ISR, that is, all the predators, reapers, hunters, warriors, and so forth we possibly can into Afghanistan. But there's no matter what we do, there, it's never going to be enough so that every time a patrol goes out, it has that eye in the sky over it, looking around, checking out its local situation. There is an alternative, though, that for the area of a FOB or for a city or for a particular length of road is just as good. It's kind of what you see every morning when you turn on the television and look at the traffic report. And that is an elevated line of sight camera. And we are going to be this summer increasing many fold the number of aerostat born cameras. They're terrific. I was just 
Kandahar a few weeks ago. There's one in Kandahar over top the city. Every patrol can have a camera looking around, a few blocks around it. Is anybody sneaking up on them? Every person of ill will in Kandahar thinks that camera is looking at them. Every person of goodwill thinks that camera is protecting them. So we're going to be introducing a lot more of them because it provides for those people under their own control the same functionality that a fancy UAV would have, uh, but it's something that we can afford to get in there this summer. So I knew I couldn't double the number of UAVs in Afghanistan this summer, but I'm going to, geez, 20-fold, whatever oople that means, the number of these elevated line-of-sight aerostats. Uh, we're uh, focused also on training so that our troops who are go into Afghanistan this summer as part of the surge are trained for the distinctive character of the IED fight in Afghanistan, one that depends on homemade explosives, for example, one that has much more decentralized networks behind it than was the case in Iraq. So we can apply some of the lessons of Iraq, but not all of the lessons of Iraq, to the case of Afghanistan. And so, John, if you go down to uh, uh, the National Training Center at Fort Irwin today, you'll find soldiers that are going to rotating into Afghanistan being trained specifically in Afghan line, lanes that are mock Afghan villages with Afghan villagers and the particular kinds of ammonium nitrate uh, and uh, fertilizer-based explosives that are distinctive to that fight. So they're going in prepared for what they're going to find in the actual area where they're going to uh, operate. And third, because we're not alone, fortunately, in Afghanistan, we're part of a coalition Secretary Gates thought it was important, he announced this in Istanbul some weeks ago, to do whatever we could, not at the expense of our own effort, but in addition to our own effort, to assist our coalition partners in their counter IED capabilities. And so we're providing them with MRAPs. We're providing them with some equipment. We're taking some of that training expertise we have to their training ranges. So when they deploy from Europe, let us say, to Afghanistan, they're getting some of the same kind of training distinctive to the mm -hmm. Afghan fight that, that our people are getting. These are all things we're doing in these weeks and these months to get us better prepared to deal with the IED threat uh, in Afghanistan. And it's remarkable what can happen when you get everybody together focused and say, I don't want to hear about anything six months from now. Tell me what you can do now how many weeks and every day pushing away to get these things done. And that brings me to logistics uh, and the huge logistics challenges that the department faces right now and the way that those logistics or challenges are being uh, uh, met. I'll start very briefly with the retrograde from uh, Iraq. Uh, the retrograde from Iraq, a huge task all by itself. Uh, of course, we have Afghanistan on top of that, which is even bigger. Just to, to pause for a moment on the retrograde from Iraq, it is not as large in terms of tonnage as was the retrograde from Iraq after Desert Storm. However, it takes place in a, uh, on a particular timetable. We need to get down to a certain level by August. Uh, it takes place in an environment where there is still threat. It goes on while we are continuing to operate. And I, don't, and I don't think this is inconsequential. It, the retrograde from Iraq takes place after being there for many years. So this wasn't like checking out of a hotel that you had been in a short, for a short time, as in Iraq after Desert Storm. This is like leaving a home you've lived in for a while. We were more settled in, more equipment. Um, and uh, so we had a lot to do. We started out with 350 fobs in uh, Iraq about a year ago, and we're closing them, uh, getting those numbers uh, down. 147,000 contractors, by the way, 
now down at about 100,000 and going down to about 75,000. You know the troop levels will be going down to 50,000. Uh, 3.4 million items of equipment about eight months ago. We're now down to 2.2 million, and we got to move another 1.2 million before uh, August. Uh, this is a variety of equipment. There's traditional military equipment, which will go back home with the units. There is equipment that was never associated with units, but was bought for Iraq and put in Iraq, so-called theater-provided equipment. That's all the green equipment. There's also white equipment, which is non-military standard equipment bought to support the fight over the years, some of it in the hands of contractors, some of it in the hands of troops. This is refrigerators, air conditioners, all, desks, all kinds of stuff, white, so-called white uh, uh, equipment. 41,000 vehicles, which is now at 29,000. So we've moved 12,000 vehicles in the last few months, and we're going to have to move many more. So this is an enormous migration uh, of equipment. One of the things that has uh, paced us is deciding where something goes. We know it doesn't belong and it isn't needed in Iraq anymore, but where does it go? Does it go home to become part of the Army or the Marine Corps of the future? Do they want it? Does it fit in? If not, guard, reserve, active, I mean, if so, guard, reserve, active duty. If not, where does it go? Does it go to Kuwait for a future contingency? Does it swing to Afghanistan? Do we leave it behind for the Iraqi forces? Do we give it to somebody else uh, who needs it? All those decisions need to be made before a piece of equipment uh, is moved. So it's not just the physical moving of it, it's decisions about where it goes. Let me now uh, close with the most important logistics challenge of all, which is Afghanistan. Afghanistan, if you, I always say, if you take a globe and spin a globe and say, where is the last place you'd like to be fighting a war if you had your choice, uh, other than Antarctica, you might well pick Afghanistan. Landlocked, very austere logistics environment. And we can't get effective until we get in, and we can't get in and get set until we have moved uh, uh, the people and equipment uh, and the means to sustain them through the very slender arteries, a couple of ground lines of communications, the air bridge. Um, and uh, so we are working every day to widen those arteries uh, and I'll give you, again, an example of the MRAP ATV. Uh, the ATV, because it's a military piece of equipment, um, we prefer to move by air, and that means flying from Charleston, where the government furnished equipment, the radios and so forth, are installed in the vehicles as they are delivered from Oshkosh, uh, <clears throat> flown to Kandahar or Bagram, there to be married up with a unit and put out in the field. Uh, we are uh, in the interest of fielding them more quickly uh, and you, being able to use the air bridge for other free up capacity on the air bridge for other urgent needs this spring and summer. Uh, we're beginning to put MRAPs on ships now. Now that we've shipped a whole lot of them into Afghanistan, while those are being absorbed and digested, we have a little time. We're putting MATVs on sea lift, taking them into theater on sea lift, transferring them there to airlift because the legs are shorter then and you can pop them in more quickly. And eventually, <clears throat> uh, to uh, may, may be able to use ground communication, the uh, ground transportation the entire way for MRAPs. So, uh, uh, you have to, in the case of logistics for Afghanistan, look at every piece of the pipe all the way through up the, in the case of ground tr uh, transportation, up the two uh, ground lines of communication to uh, Torkum and Shaman uh, from Karachi, 
over the northern distribution network and a couple branches of that up through Russia and the, the Baltics first, then Russia and the stands uh, over the Caucasus and then in through the stands. And then the intra-theater transport, whether by intra-theater airlift or the very challenging job of getting on the roads in Afghanistan and moving things around from one place to uh, another. So every day is an effort to widen those arteries. Every day is an effort to get equipment uh, into Afghanistan. And the people who do this work are truly remarkable. Uh, and um, I, my office is filled with messages about bottled water or fuel or toiletries or whatever. Uh, uh, build a, a tents, containers for troops to live in, containers for the contractors to live in so that they can support the troops, containers for the people who ship the containers to live in. Everything is like that. And everything has to be pieced out because you can't just show up in a fob with a sleeping bag. We have to make sure that people are properly taken care of when they get there. Um, I think it's fair to say that there's never been like in these months that we're witnessing right now as dramatic a logistics effort as we see in Afghanistan. It's truly remarkable. From the airlift to the sea lift to the ground lines uh, to the building of uh, fobs, uh, the laying of runways, ramp space, tent cities, container cities going up there to support what the, the, the uh, effort which uh, this summer is going to be very critical for that effort. And if we don't, in just in these next weeks and months, get ourselves in there and get set, we can't have success. So I wanted to tell you about that because I think it's one of the most important things I've ever seen in the defense uh, world uh, transpiring in very, very few weeks and months. And it's a tremendous... Uh, tribute to the logisticians in the Defense Department today that were able to do that. I had one more thing I was going to talk about, but I don't want to talk too too long, which is logistics in the acquisition system. Perhaps I can say something about in questions and answers and so forth. That's that's the logistics subject that if there were no wars going on, we'd probably be discussing. What about logistics for the Joint Strike Fighter? How can we stop spending so much uh, on sustainment of weapon systems? Also a very important topic. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'll pass on that. But I appreciate it, John, if you're still here, the opportunity uh, to talk about uh, acquisition technology and logistics as it applies to the current uh, fight. It's very different. I don't think many of my predecessors had that same circumstance. Uh, it hasn't been traditional for AT&L to uh, focus on ongoing conflict as against the programs of record and the logistic system uh, of record, but today's circumstance demand it. Uh, Secretary of Defense is very insistent uh, uh, on them, and it's a privilege to be part of such a remarkable, uh, uh, remarkably performing logistic system. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carter. Uh, many of you, of course, have been at, uh, at events here before, and you know our normal procedure. Uh, you raise your hand, and uh, if you have a question uh, that you'd like to, to ask, we have staff with, uh, with wireless microphones. Uh, I'll identify you, and you wait for the mic, uh, and then stand up and say who you are and, and where you're from, and then proceed with your question. So uh, do we have any uh, uh, folks out there who have a question they would like to raise? Uh, let me start over here uh, with the, the back one, and then we'll come. Hi, Doug Brooks with IPOA, the Association of Stability Contractors. My question is on the NATO allies and coalition partners. How much of your business is actually supporting them with contractors and logistics support? I know that you have Hungarian units there and others that certainly don't have their own logistics train, so I'm kind of wondering how much of that uh, is, uh, is, is weighing on you. 
We, it, we, they in general are, uh, there are three tiers of logistics. There's the U.S. stuff for the U.S. There are uh, nation by nation, they, the way they sustain themselves. Now, we'll let them come in our slipstream if it's convenient for them. Uh, they're generally paying separately. Then there's a NATO effort per se. Uh, everybody tries to share. i give you an example. In the South, all of our fuel we buy through the NATO system uh, because the NATO has been there in the South for quite a while. They've got a good uh, system set up. As you probably know, we pay for it at the FOB gate. I don't know how you got here. I don't care how you got here. That's your problem. I'm buying by the gallon at the FOB gate. That's the way we do it, and the trucks show up uh, from these independent contractors, and we test the fuel and then accept the fuel. That system is run by ISAF in the south. Uh, in the north, we do it ourselves. It's a DLA, Defense Logistics Agency uh, uh, task. Uh, down at uh, Bastion Leatherneck, we and the Brits uh, uh, work hand in hand, try to share our logistics and do. Uh, and we do it with all the other coalition partners as appropriate whenever we possibly can. I think I saw a question back here at the uh, second table, and then I'll come back to the middle. Uh, Mr. Secretary, Mike Mitchell with Lockheed Martin. I'd like to explore a linkage between your third and your fourth topics, uh, counter IED as well as logistics capability, in the sense that a number of firms are developing unmanned helicopter capability that could fulfill uh, niche resupply missions. It would take truck convoys off the road and in an area where, as you've cited, there's limited road mm -hmm. infrastructure uh, in the first place, could get to areas where there are no. So I'm interested in kind of where the Department's thinking is this, and there's any way to try to accelerate that capability for, for all the reasons cited? Uh, the, the great, great question, and absolutely right. To the extent you can keep people off the road, that's particularly cumbersome supply convoys uh, in outlying areas. You reduce the IED threat. Uh, we're doing a lot more airdrop this season, a lot more airdrop than we were just a few months ago. So to an outline cop that, that instead of driving trucks up there with their food and their water and their supplies and so forth, you fly over. There are GPS-controlled parachutes now that can fly it right in, uh, and you keep people off the road. Similarly, uh, we are looking at several different versions of unmanned rotary lift uh, to do the same thing. Put a pallet underneath, pick it up, flies over, flies to a base, drops it off, comes over and comes back. Wonderful way of resupplying people without having anybody take any risk um, at all. Let's uh, go to the, uh, the front table here. You'll, uh, you'll bear with me. You have to raise your hand high. Uh, there's a, a lot of nice light shining from behind you, so I can see the light a lot better than I can see the people. Thank you. Uh, Sandra Erwin with National Defense. I wanted to ask you about your uh, comments on uh, meeting the needs of the operational forces. You said that's a big priority right now. Uh, a lot of people say that one way to do that is to have more joint acquisition, that acquisition is, is not joint enough and you need to have more efficiencies to make it faster. Um, can you talk about maybe your thoughts on how that could be done and if anything is being done? Uh, <clears throat> well, it, it is a, uh, a perennial seam in our acquisition system that goes back now to Goldwater Nichols 30 years or so. As everybody in this audience knows, that in the main, Go Goldwater Nichols decreed was that we shall fight jointly. But you are right that we still, in the main, still acquire severally. And so joint acquisition has always been a challenge, and it's, an, and it's a challenge in the wars uh, as well. Uh, in all the ways you might imagine, uh, if there are inherently joint capabilities, that is, things that everybody needs, uh, like some of the counter IED enablers, all the services that are present there, that have installations there, that have personnel there, need uh, some of the EOD equipment 
and it makes sense for us to buy them in one lot. That's why we have organizations like JIEDA, the Joint IED Defeat Organization, that is, as its J suggests, joint, and it buys equipment for all the services. We also have to have different services take the lead for equipment that go to other services. So when a JUONS comes in, Joint Urgent Operational Needs Statement, uh, what's the J and J, J, JUONS mean? It means that an Army unit needs some Air Force support. And the Air Force needs to resource that support, and they do. And so the, to a really remarkable degree, all four services are involved in Afghanistan. I, my daughter uh, uh, said she was going to an event and the Secretary of the Navy was going to be there, Ray Mabus. And she knows I know Ray, so she said, what should I ask the Secretary of the Navy? And I said, ask him how many Navy people are in landlocked Afghanistan. And it's amazing. It's amazing what the Navy is doing in Afghanistan. We've had to do that because we have to take whatever capability we can and apply it to, to Afghanistan. So you're right, the contingency acquisition e is even a more demanding case of getting the system to behave jointly than is the program of record uh, joint acquisition. Dr. Carter, we, ha we have a lot more questions, but I'm also mindful of the fact that we are approaching the time that we were going to release you. Would you like to take one more? Yeah. No, All right. Happy to take uh, we have a microphone on this side here. There. Uh, let, let's take uh, the guy on the front table here. Colin Clark, DOD Buzz. Mr. Secretary, uh, Pratt & Whitney is talking about a PBL for the uh, F-135. Uh, Exactly on line to logistics me, give modernization. Me, give me one day off. One day off. Of ask a, ask a logistics It's a question. PBL. It's logistics. <laughs> it's close. No, come on. <laughs> Just one day. <laughs> Kevin Green from, <clears throat> from IBM. Uh, Dr. Carter, you mentioned a large infusion of additional ISR sensors and platforms. Could you describe the department's intention to invest in the kinds of data management and analytics capabilities that will allow that increased amount of data to be formed into actionable streams of information? Uh, it's, a, it's a huge issue. It's one of those for one of a nail things. There's no point in putting the airframe in there if you don't have the uh, the uh, ramp space, as I said, and then you have to go to get the cement for the ramp space. You also have to get the analysts. You have to have the bandwidth. You have to have the processing <coughs> capability. You have to ask yourselves questions like the one you just asked. Who actually needs this information? For one of those aerostats that I described, that, that data doesn't have to go all over Afghanistan. It doesn't have to go back to Washington. It's needed by the people down under the balloon. And so that's a much simpler case. You have a van, a few operators, a tether, the aerostat. Uh, when it comes to something like a Liberty ship, which is a complex, multi-sensor kind of intelligence, uh, uh, platform there in order to make use of that information, you know, you do need stateside, in the, let's say in the SIGINT area, support. So there's no point in introducing that aircraft unless you have the bandwidth to go back to NSA and its various facilities back here so that that data can rapidly be used. Although we are building more uh, uh, pushing forward into Afghanistan more analytical capability so that everything doesn't have to go halfway around the world. I'll say one other thing about analytical capability that is, I think is very, very important. And, I, I, uh, and that is the uh, uh, demand for intelligence analysis at levels, echelons below brigade. It's still the case that most of the analytical expertise is associated with the division and brigade level. And in this fight, which is so local, 
uh, and so information intensive. And with soldiers who are used to having information, you're used to acting on information. You go, it's remarkable. You go in the Army now has these company command posts. Um, and boy, it's not your company command post of 20 years ago. They're all at laptops. They're expecting that kind of information. They know how to be effective with that kind of, of, of information. And they need intelligence analysts at them who can tell them about this town, who can tell them about good guys as well as bad guys, because that's important in a coin fight. It's not only the threat, it's do you know your situation well enough to do the counterinsurgency uh, mission. And it's still the case that, and I know this is noted frequently, and we're fighting against it every day, that it's important to get those people down out to the outposts and down to the echelons where analysis uh, can really be uh, useful and not just writing reports uh, at the higher echelon. So all of that's in, uh, very important and is the back end of the ISR sensor front end incredibly important. Dr. Carter, we want to thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.